Hello and welcome to our webinar. Today is part one, uh, the introduction to the Sustainable Development Goal 6.6 .6 and remote sensing techniques for mangroves. My name is Temilola Fatuyinbo. And I'm Abigail Derenblit. And we'll be teaching this course today. So this course is going to be taught through a series of three one and a half hour sessions. The first session is today, November 5th. The next two sessions will be on November 12th and 19th. So the same content will be presented at two different times each day. So there will be a link of webinar recordings and PowerPoint presentations, as well as homework assignments at the appliedsciences.nasa.gov website, which you can find at this link. Following each lecture, you can reach out to ask questions at our NASA emails, which are listed here. My email is lola.fatoyinbo at nasa.gov. And my email is abigail.bearimplit at nasa.gov. There'll be three weekly homework assignments following each of these series of lectures and answers for these homework assignments can be submitted via Google Forms. There will be a certificate of completion available if you attend all three live webinars and complete homework assignments by the deadlines, which will be accessed from the RSET website. Following these assignments, you'll receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of this course from martinez.martins at ssaihq.com. We've listed on the RSET website a few prerequisites for this course. So first, we will be needing a version of TGIS, the so version 3.10, which is available through this link. You will also need to download and install the class accuracy plugin for TGIS, which we'll be using to run an accuracy assessment later in this workshop. For instructions for installation, there we have provided a link to a video as well as additional information on the RSET page for this particular webinar. We also have links here, fundamentals of remote sensing, as well as an introduction to JavaScript for Google Earth Engine, as we will not be covering the basics of Google Earth Engine in this webinar. You will also need to create a Google Earth Engine account if you do not already have one. We provided some optional links as well. So there's a Google Earth Engine beginner's cookbook, as well as a link for managing assets. And we've also provided a link to introduction to Google Earth Engine, which is an additional tutorial you can review. So over the course of this webinar, we will be taking you through understanding UN Sustainable Development Goals and then moving into a series of demos for how to working Google Earth Engine to map mangroves. So by the end of this presentation, you'll be familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. You will understand SDG 6.6 .6 and how mangroves serve as an indicator. And you will also learn how remote sensing can be used to study mangroves. So we're very happy to introduce our team, which has contributed um, a lot of the background information and the work that you will be learning today. Um, please take a look at everyone. We have a large group of collaborators from NASA centers and all over the world. So as part of our training, we'll be going through five main objectives. First, we'll talk about mangroves and their roles in clean water. We'll provide an overview of SDG 6, Water for All. Uh, then we'll start talking about remote sensing of mangroves. We'll provide you a range of research examples. And then finally, we'll go through uh, how to develop Google Earth Engine apps for communicating your science or your results. So why are we interested in mangroves? Mangrove forests provide a range of ecosystem services. They are really important for nutrient cycling, especially from upstream sources of nutrients coming through rivers. They're very important for fishery support as they provide nursery and habitat for many commercial fish species and also um, fish that are very important for biodiversity. They have a very large role in flood control as mangrove roots and trunks are able to help with um, buffering out of storm surges and tidal waves. 
they help in water quality um, as mangroves and wetlands in general are really important reservoirs for water and help with water quality. They're also very important in stabili stabilizing the coastline as mangrove trees are able to retain sediment and protect from storms uh, and waves and erosion. And finally, mangroves are also important for carbon sequestration as they are able to absorb large amounts of carbon from the at atmosphere and also store large amounts of carbon both in their trunks and in the thick layer of soil that they grow on and that they accrete. Okay, so what can we learn about mangroves by using remote sensing? We have been working on better understanding mangrove biomass and their carbon stocks on local to global scales. We're also interested in better understanding what the ecosystem condition is of mangroves. So can we detect which mangroves are intact versus which mangroves might be degraded? We're also really interested in understanding what the environmental drivers are that are resulting in different types of mangrove forest and what this means for some of the ecosystem services that they provide. And then finally, we're also really interested in using remote sensing for the management and restoration of mangrove forests worldwide. How do mangroves contribute to clean water? Because mangroves have really complex root systems, they're able to filtrate nitrates, phosphates, and heavy metals out of the water that they grow in. Those roots also really help in trapping sediments that are flowing downstream and really help in the stabilization of coastlines, which then reduces the damage from hurricanes and tropical storms. There's a wide range of risks to mangroves, which has led to a, lo a loss of a significant proportion of mangroves worldwide. Some of these risks include land use change, uh, such as deforestation or conversion to other land cover classes, uh, sea level rise. There's also degradation and conversion, as well as invasive encroachment. And finally, oil exploration has also been one of the major drivers of mangrove loss. Now we'll talk about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how mangroves fit into the SDGs. The Sustainable Development Goals are part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In total, there are 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets that aim to end poverty, to protect the planet, and improve the lives of everyone. These goals have been accepted by all UN member countries. In this webinar series, we'll focus on goal six, which is clean water and sanitation. So SDG 6, Clean Water and Sanitation, seeks to ensure the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. This goal is very important because from 2000 to 2017, the proportion of the population with access to safe drinking water has increased from 61 to 71%. However, climate change is expected to decrease the extent of freshwater bodies, making clean water and sanitation a challenge. Here Today we'll be focusing specifically on indicator 6.6.1, which is focused on the change and extent of water-related ecosystems over time. The goal of indicator 6.6.1 is to protect and restore water-related ecosystems, including mountains, forests, wetlands, rivers, aquifer, and lakes by 2020. Another goal is to halt the degradation of water-related ecosystems and assist in their recovery. To achieve these, we need to improve the knowledge of water-related ecosystems to drive action towards protection and recovery. And some examples of these water-related ecosystems and example indicators are salt marshes, wetlands, and mangroves. SDG 6 is managed by several organizations and the UN Environment Program is the custodial organization for SDG 6. And here we're showing an example of the SDG 6.6.1 Freshwater Ecosystems Explorer. You have the website below, www.sdg661.app. Here we're showing an example of the different layers that you can visualize on the Explorer. 
In addition to the different layers that you can visualize, there's also a range of uh, recommendations on how to uh, measure freshwater ecosystems and how to, how to measure water-related ecosystems in general. And here, for example, I'm showing um, a protocol on how to measure changes in mangrove areas using the existing Global Mangrove Watch layer um, for mangroves. These indicators, like 6.6.1, are the backbone of monitoring progress regionally and globally for the SDGs. The SDG indicators are also used to make target management goals, and globally, there are 100 global monitoring indicators. Mangroves support a whole range of SDGs, um, not just SDG 6. And here we've provided some examples. For example, uh, mangroves are also important for SDG 1, no poverty. SDG 2, zero hunger. Um, they are important for SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. Mangroves are also really important for SDG 13, climate action, SDG 14, life underwater, and SDG 15, life on land. So we're interested in studying mangroves for a suite of um, reasons, including uh, we're really interested in the regional and global mangrove monitoring and monitoring their and modeling their vulnerability. Uh, because we have lost a large amounts of mangroves worldwide, it's really important that we better understand where they are located and how vulnerable they are, either to land use change or climate change. We're interested in uh, better understanding mangrove wetland and forest extent, their change, and also mapping their carbon stocks. This is useful for a number of reasons, including assisting national forest inventories, uh, helping with natural capital accounting. And to do these, we've developed a suite of techniques, including three-dimensional mapping of forest structure. And we can do this from LIDAR, from radar, and from stereo photogrammetry. Mangrove forests or mangrove ecosystems are primarily found in tropical and subtropical coastlines worldwide. You'll see here that the distribution ranges from uh, at the northernmost part, uh, Japan and China, and on the Western Hemisphere in the Southern US, all the way in the Southern Hemisphere to New Zealand and Southern Australia. And they are found on almost every tropical coastline worldwide. Mapping mangroves and studying mangroves comes with a number of challenges, um, both in the field and remote sensing. In the field, it is very difficult uh, when you're on the ground to conduct surveys in mangroves, they're often costly and time consuming. And because mangroves are a difficult environment to uh, move around in because of above ground roots, lots of mud and standing water, um, it can often be uh, challenging to conduct large scale assessments on the ground. In addition, rapid urbanization and human development has been leading to constant changes in mangrove forests. And when we're working with remote sensing of mangroves, because they are primarily located in tropical regions, which are also often the most cloudy regions, we might have challenges with clouds and obscured regions in the imagery. So next we're gonna talk a bit about remote sensing of mangroves and the different satellite technologies available that allow us to study mangroves and examples of how we are able to use this technology in research. So we were able to remotely sense mangroves to measure not only extent and understand where mangroves are found, but also to measure height, biomass, and carbon stock. And we are able to do this using not only optical data, but also radar data, as well as LIDAR. As a quick review, optical data, when, when we are talking about optical data, we are talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. So this data uses waves from the spectrum. So for example, Landsat 8 measures visible near infrared and shortwave infrared bands from the spectrum. 
And we can use these bands to calculate different indices that are helpful in understanding changes in vegetation. So a uh, primary example of this is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, which uses near-infrared and visible red bands to calculate vegetation and some sort of indicator of vegetation. Landsat and Sentinel are two examples of satellite series that we use to measure both optical and radar data. So optical imagery from the satellite series comes at a 25 to 30 meter resolution. And Sentinel-1 star, which is radar, comes at a 10, 25, or 40 meter resolution, depending on the swath we are using. This can be used to measure extent, particularly from the optical imagery. And then SAR can also be used for adding some details about the structure of the area that we're studying. And often we're using the bands that these uh, satellites collect data through as predictors in machine learning models. And this will be something that we will approach in the second part of this workshop, where we talk about random forest models and how we use these models to actually map mangroves. In addition to satellite imagery from public, publicly available satellites like Landsat and Sentinel, there's also very high resolution data that is available through commercial companies like Digital Globe and Planet. These, um, these companies provide data that is at a very fine resolution from 31 centimeters to 5 meters, which can provide even more details when we are looking at changes across the landscape. These satellite systems provide data for both optical data as well as stereo photogrammetric data. We can also use radar to study mangroves. So uh, an example of this would be from Sentinel SAR data. This uses radio waves to determine range, angle, and velocity. And it is often used for meteorology. So you've probably heard the term radar before in talks about weather. Uh, it can also be used to measure soil moisture and land cover. And the backscatter from uh, radar data can help us distinguish between simple and complex land cover, which can improve our studies of mangroves by distinguishing those areas from other vegetation. LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging, emits a laser pulse from a sensor. And the return time to the sensor allows us to distinguish structural elements across the landscape. There are sensors that are airborne as well as spaceborne. So, for example, JEDI, which is aboard the International Space Station, is a spaceborne LIDAR sensor. These sensors enable us to get very accurate measurements of canopy height and underlying surface elevation. So now we'll show you a few examples of the research that we have done using remote sensing to study mangroves. So here you see a combination of radar and LIDAR sensors that we have been using to study mangrove three-dimensional structure. On the uh, synthetic aperture radar side, we've been working with the Tandem X mission and the SRTM mission. These are both systems that are able to measure surface topography and canopy height. On the LIDAR side, we've been working with the ISAT GLASS mission and the follow-on mission, which is ISAT-2, as well as the JEDI mission um, on the International Space Station. And the bottom right here, what you see is an example of an airborne LIDAR system. And the video um, shows previously acquired LIDAR data over a mangrove forest. So uh, it really highlights the um, detail uh, that you can see with the high resolution airborne data set. Using some of these data sets, specifically the um, SRTM digital elevation model and ISAT glass data that was collected globally, we were, we were able to produce the first global map of mangrove height. And by combining our, our canopy height measurements from 
uh, the remote sensing data sets with field measurements that we've collected in 13 sites around the world, we were also able to estimate above ground biomass and carbon stocks for the baseline year 2000. So here are some um, examples of this global mangrove height and biomass map for the year 2000, really highlighting the amount of variation that you see in canopy height. In fact, we even found that um, even though most of the mangroves around the world are short, they're between you know, 5 and 14 meters, in some regions, including in um, Colombia and in Gabon, so in some equatorial regions, these trees are actually able to grow up to 65 meters tall. Now, these, these results are not only interesting from a carbon accounting perspective and from a scientific perspective, but can also be used to um, help with management and planning and to report on sustainable development goals. So we've also produced a app that you see here in Google Earth Engine, where you can visualize the data and get a better understanding of um, what the distribution of canopy height, biomass, and carbon stocks is um, on a per country basis. So here you can actually click on a country and um, get the results for the countrywide stocks and countrywide structural metrics. These, these results are presented in, as a table or as a bar chart that can be copied or exported for better reporting. Another example I'd like to show you is some work that we have done on better understanding what the causes or the drivers of mangrove loss have been on a global scale. Here I'm showing you a very high resolution image that was acquired from the G-Light sensor. This is on a camera looking downward. On the left, you have an image that was acquired in March of 2017. And on the right, you have an image that was acquired in December of 2017 after Hurricane Irma um, went through the Everglades National Park. So what you're seeing here is before and after imagery from a hurricane uh, or a tropical cyclone, which is one of the large drivers of mangrove loss on a global scale. Another example of an extreme loss is shown here in the Gulf of Carpentaria in Australia. And this is really uh, one of the stories that motivated us to um, take a better look at what the main drivers of loss were in mangroves on a global scale. These images show you um, a very rapid loss and die off of an um, extensive mangrove forest in Northern Australia. This is a die off that, um, because it wasn't such a remote location, was not observed for a really long time um, and was not explained as well. And so by using remote sensing and regular mapping and of mangrove losses, um, we were hoping to better understand what is causing some of these losses all over the world. So in order to map uh, mangrove loss extent on a global scale, we used a combination of Landsat data sets. We used Landsat 5, 7, and 8 imagery and separated it into two different periods. So we used the entire Landsat archive that was covering all mangrove areas across the world. And our goal was to look at the differences in NDVI, so Normalized Differentiated Vegetation Index, to try to find an anomaly. So trying to find differences or changes from a baseline value in order to detect changes in mangroves. So to do this, we separated all of our Landsat imagery into two periods. We have a reference period from 1998 to 2001, and then we have the observation period, so the period during which we are actually mapping the losses from 2000 to 2016. For the reference period, we determine what the mean NDVI value is for that whole period. And then in the observation period, we look at what the changes in NDVI are on an annual basis as compared to the reference period. This then gives us an NDVI change anomaly. Here's an example showing you what this anomaly looks like. This is a mangrove area in Sulawesi in Indonesia. And essentially what you're seeing here with the different colors is areas where you have a, an anomaly. So here you have an NDVI value that is different from the baseline or the average NDVI value. 
and we have a thresholding metric where if the difference in NDVI is more than 0 0.2, then we assign this as a change. Following the change mapping, so once we know where all of the changes are happening, we then use the random forest classifier to separate the types of changes that we were seeing into different classes. So we separated these changes into bare soil, water, and wet soil using training data that we collected from Landsat imagery. We then applied a random forest classification to separate them into these three classes. Um, and this resulted in the land cover change classification that you're seeing here on the right. So on the right here is an example of land cover change uh, into the different classes, whether, whether mangrove changed into water, whether it changed into bare soil, or whether it changed into wet soil. Here I'm showing another example of what this land cover change classification then looks like. On the bottom left here image, you're seeing that a majority of the changes actually changed to what we would call dry soil. Um, on the right, a majority of the changes changed to wet soil. And depending on what type of land cover the mangroves were converted to, this then gives us an indication of what the main driver of the loss is. Was it changed to agriculture, uh, for example, which most likely we would think that that change would be a dry soil, you would have a dry soil, or was it changed to aquaculture or a fish pond, which would uh, look like water. After the random forest land cover classification, we just went through a series of decision trees. I won't go in detail through all of the decision trees, but essentially we used the decision trees and um, a number of decisions, as well as uh, a range of existing global layers of land use um, for example, a sediment, settlement layer or global agricultural or a global agricultural layer to then separate the types of land covers that we mapped using the random forest classification into different types of land uses. In the next step, we then separated the different land cover changes that were determined using the random forest classification into five different drivers or land uses. Those drivers are erosion, commodities, commodities such as aquaculture or agriculture, um, changes due to human settlements such as urbanization, cutting of mangroves to uh, build uh, cities or expand, expand um, tourism infrastructure, non-productive conversion, which essentially means um, cutting of mangroves and not changing the mangrove cover to anything um, that is really visible from the satellite imagery, or um, extreme climatic events. This would be tropical cyclones, tropical storms, um, or droughts. So here are our results. So here we're showing an example of um, conversion to commodities. In this case, it was primarily aquaculture ponds in Sulawesi, Indonesia. Here's another example from the Sundarbans in Bangladesh, where again, the main driver is erosion. Here you're seeing these erosional bands, how the outer layer of mangroves is lost first and then progressively um, Mangroves are, lo mangroves are lost going inland. Finally, here's another example highlighting the phenomenon of the coastal squeeze, meaning that there are pressures coming both from the landward side and the seaward side that are not allowing mangroves to either expand seaward or landward when they're having the changes. So what you see here is that there's erosion on the on the seaward side, erosion of the coastal of the coastal zone, leading to losses in mangroves, and then on the inward side you're seeing um, loss of mangroves due to commodities. In this case, it's due to agriculture and expansion of rice fields. So here are the global trends on a national scale. All of all of our results were exported by country as well as by time frame. 
And if we look at the overall trend um, from 2000 to 2016, we're seeing that there is a large distribution of um, the different drivers, um, but with patterns on a countrywide scale. When you look at the Americas, for example, we're seeing that erosion is one of the main drivers of loss, um, both in the uh, US and in South America. Whereas if you look at um, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Philippines, for example, uh, commodities are the main driver of loss. Here I'm showing all of the loss drivers broken down by continent, highlighting that even though we do have these main drivers, there is a large distribution of the main drivers of loss by continent. Uh, and then what, if we look on a, on a global scale, in addition to having the uh, per country and per continental breakdown, we could also look at countrywide drivers um, throughout time. So here I'm showing an example of lost driver trends from 2000 to 26 in Myanmar. And what we see here is that mangrove loss was really the highest in that 2000 to 20, 2005 period, but has declined significantly since then. This is something that we're seeing all over the world, which is why um, the main, the title of the study was Global Declines in Mangrove Losses. So now that we have um, all of these different layers, the, one of the goals is to go towards a global mangrove vulnerability assessment. We now know the losses and gains. We have a good idea of land cover change in mangroves. Um, we know the lost drivers. We also have maps of canopy height, biomass, and carbon. So really our goal is to combine all of these and to get a better understanding what the global vulnerability is of mangroves in terms of the ecosystem services they provide. So here's an example of uh, what we can tell when we combine all of these data sets together. Here I'm showing uh, mangrove height trends in areas that are um, converted by commodities. So here we have some examples in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam and the Mahakam Delta in Indonesia uh, in Eastern Myanmar um, in eastern Kalimantan, Indonesia, north Kalimantan, Indonesia, and Kabin, Myanmar. So really here we have some examples primarily out of Asia where most of the changes um, due to commodities have been happening. So what we're seeing here is that when you compare the distribution of canopy height, so this is how many trees of a certain height um, you see in these regions, when we compare the frequency in areas that are stable, so areas where you're not seeing much change, um, to those areas where you are seeing a much change or many mangroves are converted to commodities, you see that those areas where you have a lot of impact on the mangroves actually have a tendency to have shorter mangroves than those areas where you, you have a more stable and protected mangrove forest. So the next step in presenting the results of some of these research efforts is to enable users to access them in a more user-friendly format. And one way we can do that is by creating apps in Google Earth Engine. So these apps are really useful for communicating results because we can take the work that we have produced that is often uh, involves a lot of code in JavaScript or Python, and we can turn them into an app so that the user does not have to have to interact with any code to visualize results from these studies. It allows global users to track their progress and measure mangrove extent and biomass. So we can create apps that are particularly relevant for SDGs, particularly SDG 6 because it is a useful way of communicating results so that the users do not have to actually interact with code. So we are able to take results from work that may have generated a lot of code in Google Earth Engine, but provide it in such a way that the user can visualize results and visualize different layers without having to reproduce that code. This then allows global users to track progress towards SDG goals 
and me measure mangrove extent or biomass without having any knowledge of Google Earth Engine and of coding. So this offers our results that can be reported as SPG indicators and can be used to monitor progress towards those SPG goals. So this is an example app that we've created that is relevant for SPG goals. This is our mangrove height and biomass map. And this explorer allows users to navigate around the map and pull out results that are relevant to their country. So for example, in this app, the user is able to view a visualization of canopy height, but also pull out numbers of total carbon, of, of biomass, and have relevant results that can be used to track progress towards SDG goals. Our team has created a variety of apps in Google Earth Engine to present results of different research that we have performed. So for example, this is taking the global mangrove loss drivers map that Lola was discussing a few slides earlier and displaying those results in a way that the user can interact with different layers and visualize information and results and gain access to the paper associated with those results without, again, without having to interact with any of the code. This is another example looking at Delta mangrove cover change and canopy height and biomass. So this explorer is, allows users to view examples of those layers in different deltas throughout the world. And by providing graphs through the widget capabilities of Google Earth Engine, we can allow the user to visualize these results. And so here we're starting to see some of the capabilities of Google Earth Engine app. Later in this tutorial, we will actually go through the process of creating an app, but we are going through these examples to help you start visualizing the capabilities of Google Earth Engine and what apps can allow the user to view. This is a global maker of height and biomass explorer that again can be used to relate back to SDG goals and allow users to compare total biomass, um, canopy height in different areas of the world. So this app allows users to click on different countries and draw comparisons through graphing the results of uh, metrics like above ground biomass. Now for the next section of the tutorial, we'll be talking about random forest classification and how we can use that to map mangroves. We will be going through a process that uses code in Google Earth Engine's code editor to run this type of model. However, we've also been able to create an app that allows users to run a random forest classification without having to interact with the code. So this is a, a little bit more complicated because the user is, uh, essentially running a model and creating training data on their end through our app. And this shows, again, some of the more complicated features you can add to apps as you get more familiar with Google Earth Engine. Finally, we've created a mangrove data set workflow. There are several different global data sets available for allowing users to study and understand mangroves. However, each have different capabilities. So we decided to make a workflow that takes the user through different options for spatial resolution availability, uh, whether they want to view annual changes or decadal changes. And by putting in these preferences, the user can get information on which data sets that pertain to the type of work that they want to do. And so this is a series of dropdowns. You'll notice that it doesn't have any graphs, but it's another way that we are providing users with information on how to better study mangroves and how to better understand what data sets are available in a user-friendly um, graphical user interface format. Following this section of the workshop, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box. We will be posting the questions and answers to the training website following the conclusion of the course. So thank you for joining us for the first section of this workshop.
Uh, we'll try to address as many questions as we can during the Q&A session. And if we're unable to address your question, feel free to reach out to us. So the homework for this week is already available on the training website. Feel free to check that out following this session. It is not required ahead of part two. However, it does go over some review of Google Earth Engine and some of the topics that we talked about today. So it may be a good refresher before we move into the second part of the tutorial. And for the next part of this tutorial, we will actually be walking through some of the processes for measuring mangrove extent. We will go into a demo in Google Earth Engine, and we will actually be learning how to construct a random forest classification to measure mangrove extent using some of the satellite technology that we've been talking about today. So with that, thank you so much for joining us for the first section of this workshop. And we look forward to having you join us for the next two in this series. Now we'll go to the question and answer session um, and answer some of the questions that we've gotten over the period of this webinar. Um, okay, so question one was, um, how do you map mangrove ecosystems in small islands like Pacific Island mangroves? Uh, what satellite data would be the most appropriate to use? So when you're working in small island nations, it can be quite difficult to map mangroves because they're often um, a smaller extent because the whole island is smaller. So um, it really depends on what your application is, which data set you would like to use, um, and it depends on the size of the mangrove. Um, forest. And so if you're, so some recommended data sets are Landsat, um, Sentinel-2. So Landsat is at um, 30 meter resolution. Sentinel-2 is at 10 to 20 meter resolution. Um, and um, uh, otherwise, if you're looking at smaller mangrove patches, you might be interested in using commercial data sets. So these are data sets like um, uh, rapid eye or planet data or worldview data. Uh, those data sets have a resolution between a meter and three meters. But again, these are commercial data sets, so uh, sometimes you have to buy them. Although just recently, Planet has made um, more mosaics available. Um, the advantage of using Landsat is that you will be able to map change over time for three decades or sometimes more, um, depending on where you are because there are areas where Landsat goes back all the way to the early 1970s. Um, with Sentinel, you can start mapping change starting approximately in, uh, I think, 2015. OK, so um, going forward to question two, um, do we have a model that integrates remote sensing and uh, geographical information systems methods in ecosystem evaluation of mangrove ecosystems? And do we have some related literature on this mo these models? So I would say there are many, many studies that are focused on just estimating the, or just valuing the different ecosystem services that mangroves provide. And they are really um, dependent on location. So, um, and, and then there are probably also some global studies. Um, there has been a lot of work on mangrove carbon, this is something that we work on a lot as well. So that's one, you know, one ecosystem service that has a lot of evaluation work. Um, there's also some studies on, you know, storm buffering or um, water quality, that is um, ecosystem services that are provided by mangroves or fisheries, etc. So in general, what you would do is that these, these valuation studies will end up giving you a value for an entire ecosystem or a specific site, or even maybe a value per a certain area, so per hectare, for example. If you then have a map that you generated using remote sensing and GIS, you would then multiply that per hectare value by the number of, of hectares of your, of your site of interest. And um, yes, we'll try to paste some, some more examples of ecosystem valuation studies in there. Uh, 
Abigail, you want to take the next question? Yep, I can address that, Marjorie. So um, someone mentioned that they were unable to install the class accuracy plugin. So when you go to the GitHub and download the folder that the plugin is in, make sure that you um, take out, there's a, a readme file in the file, and then you have to zip together the other file, the class accuracy, um, I think it's just the class, class accuracy master zip. So just make sure that when you open that file, there's two folders, take out the readme file and zip the other one, and that's what you should be installing into QGIS. Question four, you want to take it? Yep, I can take that. Um, so when we are compositing Landsat images for an area, we're often collecting images before and after the exact date of interest. So um, for example, we'll go a year or before and after, if we're studying 2018, we'll get images from 2017 to 2019. So what we do is we mosaic these images and collect all the best pixels from each of these images to create a cloud-free mosaic, and that can help make up for some of the issues of um, cloudy images in areas where mangroves are found. Okay, um, question five, how do you distinguish between mangrove forests and adjacent other forests? Um, so this is where your, your expert knowledge as a map maker is really needed. Um, essentially, we start, and you will see this during the training, we have to collect some training data and where we know that there are mangroves. Um, so this can be done by looking at you know, different satellite imagery, or if you have GPS points, those are obviously also great if you have actual um, in-situ data sets or coordinates of mangrove locations. Um, luckily, when we're mapping them, mangroves are quite distinct in their location. They're always on the coast, but they only grow in intertidal areas. Um, they're only in areas that are flat, so you can, um, you know, already uh, essentially map out those areas that are over even 40 meters. You won't have any mangroves there if you're using a, a digital elevation model, for example. And then they're very distinct in texture and color. So in general, it's quite straightforward to distinguish them. Um, but if you have areas with very dense tropical forests that's adjoining or directly touching the mangroves, it can be challenging. So when you're working in more um, uh, equatorial settings where you have dense tropical forests, it, it's a challenge um, to distinguish between mangroves and other um, forest types. So in those cases, it's best to combine data from multiple types of sensors. So, for example, we combine Landsat data with radar data from Sentinel-1, um, and then we also use a digital elevation model to um, only select those areas that are, that are under a certain elevation. Mm, okay, so question six. In a long time series, when comparing values of a year with the average of a period, what would be more convenient, taking a certain month, a specific date, looking for the values of all the months of the year? Um, so I'm assuming that this person is looking at like the spectral values, for example, or NDVI, and want to compare the, you know, the NDVI value um, for one year with the average of a, a reference period, similar to what we did before. So. Um, I would say it, it all depends on what question you're trying to answer, um, what, what dates you would use. But generally speaking, I think it's best to um, use um, specific time frame, like date frames. I would recommend using a time frame where you have multiple image acquisition so that you can average across the images because, you know, these values may change over time with also environmental settings. It might not just be the actual um, spectra from the forest. So when we are comparing, you know, um, it's data from one year to previous, data, to previous values, we actually usually take an average across the year. 
Um, I would say the more, the, the larger the average is, it's probably better, but it all depends on cloudiness of your region. It depends on what you're trying to address. If you're looking at a certain season in particular, if you want to look at flooding or certain conditions and how that affects the mangroves, then you will have to, you know, determine what time frame is the best. Okay, uh, question seven. A uh, question regarding land use change decision tree. Um, how are we able to assign the mangrove loss drivers to the uh, mangrove loss to different drivers? Did we overlay the mangrove loss maps with maps from the different drivers? Yes. So this is where um, we use ancillary data. We had um, global data sets of um, agricultural areas, for example, and um, a whole slew of ancillary data sets that we used. I think the most, the most important one was trying to determine whether it was a commodity or not. So whether it was changed to, or if it was what we're calling non-productive conversion, essentially if it was cut, but it wasn't converted to something else. So we used ancillary data, and then we also had some rules like distance to, you know, is it on the ocean side or is it, is it land side loss? If it was ocean side and it was connected to water, um, then there would be a set of rules that would show us that, okay, it, it is probably erosion. If it was um, a conversion from mangrove to open water, um, and then in the global commodities layer, it showed us that that open water was now agriculture, um, then we could assume that it would be a uh, aquaculture pond, for example. So there was a series of, of decisions like that. And I won't go through them all in detail, but if you go to our um, website, it's mangrovelossdrivers.app. Um, you can find the paper and you can find all of the details on, you can find the code and everything on there. Okay, question eight, how does erosion affect mangroves? Yes, erosion along the coastline, it, it, exactly, it strips the sediment, so it washes away the, the underlying soil, um, which then can result in the loss of um, those uh, mangroves because they have nothing to attach to. So if you have, you know, large waves, you have strong, strong erosional and strong currents that can lead to erosion and the loss of mangroves. Okay, can we use Google Earth to get these types of radar images? It's yes. Uh, sorry, yes, and my question nine. Um, are they available for past years as well? So we can use Google Earth Engine. Um, Google Earth Engine is, is the actual satellite image processing um, program whereas Google Earth is a different program that we use to um, visualize uh, maps and certain satellite data. There is no, there's no radar data, I don't think, in Google Earth. Um, there is radar data in Google Earth Engine. And uh, yes, we use Sentinel-1SAR data that's available from 2014 to, to, to present date. Um, there's also, yes, there's the global ALOS PALSAR yearly mosaic. ALOS PALSAR is an L band synthetic aperture radar, it's a Japanese instrument. And there's yearly mosaics available from 2007 to 2018. Um, and those are at um, 30 meter resolution. Okay. Um, will we be witnessing a hands-on experience of using the random force classifier? Yes, that's that's the whole point of this of this training. You'll cover that in the second session next week. Um, question eleven: Is it possible to distinguish between true mangrove species and mangrove associates doing using satellite imagery? This is actually a really interesting question because um, you know we are really interested not only in classifying where mangroves are, but now going to the next level, which is really distinguishing between species. Um, I think it all depends on which mangrove associate you are meaning. Uh, I'm thinking of one example, which is quite common in uh, Southeast Asia, which is the Nipah palm. So we have had some luck at distinguishing between mangroves and Nipah palm. Uh, NIPA is N-I-P-A. 
Um, and because uh, they have different, because the NIFA is a palm, um, so it, it does look different on the satellite imagery. Um, so I think, yes, if you have that expert knowledge or, again, training data, and also we have found that using the um, SAR data seems to help a lot in distinguishing between like palm species and um, other mangrove species. Now, other mangrove associates like the buttonwood and things like that, um, I, I'm not sure we have not tried that yet. Okay, question 12. Um, I wish to know the influence of coastline in mangrove ecosystems and how to determine the digital spot line with Landsat images. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, Abigail, do you have an idea? I, uh, was, I was hoping you would understand this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, it would be, yes, it would be great if you could um, rephrase. Um, Thank you. Okay, is 30 meter resolution uh, enough for land, land use and land cover change detection? Um, I would say yes, it is, you know, it all depends on the size of your land cover. Of course, if your changes are smaller than 30 meters, then no, it will be quite difficult to detect those and to do uh, land use change analysis. But most changes, I mean, on a global scale, we, or even if it's not on a global scale, but when using satellite data, if you're looking on a, on a smaller scale on a specific site and you want to know the drivers or the areas of change, you will probably have to use a different data set. Um, however, the Landsat data set, it does work really well. It does a great job at, det at detecting change. So even with 30 meters resolution, you can still see very small um, you can still detect small areas of change. Okay. Um, okay, question 15. How can we, oh, question 14 first. Some mangroves, in particular the rhizophora species, have crop roots that may present above 1.3 meters. How does LIDAR detect the carbon stock or DBH of these mangrove trees given their crops or silt roots? So LIDAR does not measure DBH. Um, what we use the LIDAR for is to measure the canopy height, so the height of the trees or the height of the multiple trees, of all of the trees within a, a LIDAR footprint. We are not measuring DBH. Um, what we do is that we develop um, models that relate allometric models that relate the canopy height of mangrove trees either to biomass directly so we do this by using you know in situ measurements that we have or by um, by developing allometric models that compare the canopy height to the diam to the dbh of the tree so dbh being diameter at the first height Um, if you do want to use LIDAR to measure um, DBH or um, the prop roots, then it is a different instrument that's used. This is not a LIDAR that is on an airplane or a LIDAR that's on a satellite or the International Space Station. In that case, we would use a terrestrial LIDAR, a terrestrial laser scanner. This is more of an actually a field instrument. So we um, take that into the field and it measures takes very detailed measurements of um, the structure, essentially the distance of where the scanner is to all of the materials around it. Um, and so, but it's, it's such a, at a much smaller scale. Um, but if you're using airborne LIDAR or um, spaceborne LIDAR, what we're looking at is the canopy height. Okay, how can we calculate the coastal stabilization rate slash condition by mangrove ecosystems using remote sensing? Oh, um, that's a really good question and not one that I really have the answer to now. I think this is where um, 
we you know need people here that are taking this webinar to to help us um, develop the methods or do the analysis. I think you would probably need to look at areas that have mangroves versus areas that do not have mangroves but that are nearby and under similar conditions and compare this the coastal um, the change in the coastal um, area between those two um, those two areas. Yeah. Okay. Um, question sixteen. Is there a landing page to choose between the six mangrove DEE apps? Um, yes. So many of our apps can be found through our lab website, mangrovescience.org, um, and we update this on a regular basis. And usually we develop these apps for papers that we produce. Um, so, um, you know, any new papers or new research coming out, there might be a new app that is developed with that. Um, but yes, if you go to mangrovescience.org, you should find them. Okay, what is the accuracy of the biomass and canopy height quantified in the GEE app? Okay, so the, the canopy height accuracy on a global scale was, um, I have to check, but I think it was about four meters, plus or minus four meters. So we don't do a great job at mapping really short mangroves. Um, and then, so any, any, area or patch with mangroves that are very short, um, we are essentially assigned it to a value of being very short, of being four meters or less. Um, and then any measurement that you have could be plus or minus um, about four meters. Um, but I would like to say that that is, it, it seems like a lot, but it's actually if you're looking on a global scale and at 30 meter resolution, it's actually a very um, good estimate because even when we go in the field and we measure canopy height of mangrove trees, if multiple people measure the same tree, you will have a difference of about 10% in the canopy height measurements. So we're quite happy. Um, on the biomass, it, it varies. It varies. Um, we have different biomass models by region. Um, and for biomass, the accuracy is um, lower than it is for canopy height because we're, we are um, essentially uh, compounding the, the errors from the field measurement to the canopy height measurement getting to biomass. So I think the biomass estimate has an error of um, I think it's about 60 tons per hectare, plus or minus. Is it possible to use, and this is question 18, um, Google Earth Engine to model the impact of different scenarios of sea level rise on mangrove biomass density? Um, and Abigail, you want to take yeah. this one? Right. Um, so there, there aren't any global or even national data sets for sea level rise already in, um, input into Earth Engine the way there is Landsat data. Um, however, it's it's fairly straightforward to import some of these rasters of projections into Earth Engine. So I haven't worked directly with sea level rise yet. But I would imagine that if you already have access to the correct data sets, um, it's similar to using any sort of GIS program where if you already have the data available, you can run all sorts of different analyses on them. And also to follow up, I actually think there is a sea level rise data set in Google Earth Engine, um, a gridded one, but I cannot remember the name of it. However, this is not something that we, as Abigail said, we haven't, we haven't looked at this yet, so we'll have to double check what it is. I'll, I'll look while you're answering questions, and if I can find the link, I'll post it in question 18. Right. Okay. Um, question 19. I'm planning on focusing my research on monitoring mangroves after a recent oil spill on a small island nation. 
Um, would you recommend using NDVI or a different index? Um, so I'm wondering if you mean if this is a a um, question about monitoring mangroves after the recent oil spill in Mauritius. Um, and yes, um, I think yes, looking at NDVI would be a good, is a good place to start. Um, and Abigail actually put together a quick app on the oil spill in Mauritius, looking at different um, data sets, and maybe we can post a link here. Yeah, I'll find that. Um, okay, can I please suggest uh, some good open source software modules or packages for dealing with satellite data, HDF files, and etc. Yes, so you know, as part of this training, you will learn how to um, analyze satellite data in Google Earth Engine, um, which I recommend starting with that. Um, otherwise, there are many tutorials that are available through RSET using different open source software. Um, I would recommend otherwise using QGIS, which is an open source um, GIS software. Um, Python and R are also two other um, very commonly used softwares or options, yes. Okay, what is the best model for comparing 30 meter Landsat reference data with Sentinel to 10 meter resolution? Um, yeah, this is this is a uh, sometimes a an issue because it's hard to go between resolutions between different data sets. So there isn't a specific model that you can use to do this. Um, it's it's really dependent on your site and on the accuracy of the of the maps and the data sets that you're working with. One, one thing that you can do is to, you know, um, decrease the resolution of the Sentinel data so that it matches the Landsat, but that's, that takes away from, you know, the point of using Sentinel is to have a higher resolution. Okay, question 22, can we identify mangrove species? Yes, so this is, again, as I mentioned, a very interesting and um, uh, important aspect of, of mangrove ecology is to map different species compositions. I would say um, it's very difficult to map. You, you won't be able to map individual tree species um, at this point with Landsat data, for example, or uh, Sentinel. You can try to map species assemblages or zones. So if you have really distinct zonation of mangroves, like one zone for uh, Rhizophora versus Avicennia, you might be able to separate those. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we found that combining the different um, types of spaceborne data is really what helps us um, the most. So we have done some work uh, combining Tandemex um, SAR data with uh, high, resolution, high resolution data from Worldview and really intense uh, in situ measurements in the Sundarbans of Bangladesh to determine different species compositions. Um, and I can share the link for that paper in here somewhere as well. Um, we've also been trying to work on distinguishing between Nipah palm and other mangroves. People have done work on on distinguishing between Avicennia species and Rhizophora, so red versus black mangroves. Um, it all depends on your site, how dis on how you know clearly you can yeah, detect the mangrove species um, in the satellite data and how how uh, strong the zonation is. Okay, do you have um, similar 
um, methods, I'm assuming, to test for salt marshes or even seagrass? If not, would it be possible to develop similar technological tools? Yes, so many of the mapping tools that you will learn or that we, that we use are applicable to other types of vegetation. Um, salt marshes in particular are you know, similar to mangroves. So uh, yes, you know, we also work on salt marsh mapping. Um, seagrass is much more difficult because it's submerged. And so you have to take into account um, you know, all of the challenges that come with mapping an underwater ecosystem. Um, but, but there are many efforts now on mapping seagrasses or even coral. Um, these, these efforts are primarily focused in areas where you will have clear water because that's the only way that you would be able to um, map um, or to, to even see the seagrass from, from optical data. Um, yeah, and, and actually we, we are working on trying to um, de detect or develop the methods for better seagrass mapping as well. Okay. Question 24. Okay. Um, so is it advisable to map mangrove cover changes imagery from Google Earth Pro? Um, it really depends on your area of interest and the available imagery. There are some areas that do have available imagery on a, on a relatively annual basis. One of the reasons why we use Landsat and similar satellites, however, is because they tend to have more consistent coverage globally. So Google Earth Pro does provide finer resolution, just like Worldview and um, planet data. So, um, but it may not have consistent coverage. So if you're trying to look at annual changes, it may not be advisable. Um, however, if you're trying to compare decadal changes and there is decadal data available, um, it, it's definitely usable. It really, it really depends on what time frame you're looking at, how large of a study area, and just is the imagery available for that study area. Um, well, I don't know if you're speaking or not, but we, we can't hear you if you are. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking and I was muted. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Um, this is, you know, a question looking at changes in mangrove distribution um, with changes in climate that we're seeing in temperatures and weather patterns. So, um, there, there have definitely been instances of mangrove, what we're calling mangrove migration. And this is primarily happening um, in those regions where we have the, uh, the the limit of distribution of mangroves. That is why we're seeing it. So in the northern hemisphere, this would be the northernmost mangroves are moving a little bit further north. So in the U United States, for example, that or, or in the northern hemisphere, that would be, you know, in Florida, we're seeing mangroves move a little bit further north. Or in the southern hemisphere, like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, we're seeing mangroves moving further south. Um, and yes, there are people who work specifically on that. There have been many studies showing uh, the migration of mangroves at the at their distributional limits. Okay, question 26. Are there methods available to integrate drone imagery into satellite imagery uh, training processes for mangrove carbon stock measurements? Yes. Um, so using drone imagery has been really popular and a very, um, you know, interesting way of moving from the field measurements to something that's in between an airborne and between field airborne and spaceborne measurements. So um, in many ways, we actually use the drone, drone imagery as field measurements or as, as calibration. So we compare uh, you can use the digital elevation models that, that are produced using drones um, to train, you know, uh, your data that you're getting from Spaceform. And I can, I can take this one if you like. For large scale nationwide modeling of random forests, is it possible with Earth Engine? Again, this really depends on your study area, but generally, yes. 
you can definitely run into limits with Earth Engine's capacity and memory uh, capabilities. But depending on how much training data you use and the number of land cover classes you include in your model, um, generally it, it's it's definitely doable. We'll actually be doing a, a nationwide um, mangrove random forest classification for Guyana. So especially with mangroves, because we are just analyzing coastlines, we typically don't run into problems with running these models in Earth Engine. Okay, the next question is, for the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, there's a system of integrated mangrove shoot farms. Is the random forest mapping tool able to classify the extent of mangrove in this system? So um, that's a really interesting question because I have seen this and we wondered for a long time what we were looking at. Um, so I think what, what the question is about is um, in the Mekong Delta, you have these, these ponds, aquaculture ponds, and then in between the ponds or something in them, you have mangroves growing. So um, yes, in general, we are able to map those mangroves. These ponds are large and the mangrove forests are also quite um, large as long as it's you know over 30 meters uh, you know of size if it's you know larger than the pixel size we should be able to map it um you know if if there are small patches of mangroves again you know they're too small we won't detect them but in general i think for the mekong specifically we have we have mapped these uh, mangrove uh, patches um, Okay, question 29. How do I correct for tides in mapping mangroves? I noticed that in some mangrove forests, there are times that the forest is somewhat inundated by tides. Will this affect my remote sensing model? So that's a really good question. And tides and water is actually one of the ways that we are able to, di di to distinguish mangroves from other types of forests. So generally speaking, the tides, yes, it will affect your, your map. But as you'll see in the training, because we are, we are making these mosaics um, that um, cover multiple time frames, that usually takes into account the tides. Um, in addition, mangroves grow only in intertidal areas, and they grow above the water level. So even if there is a high tide, you should still be able to see that the mangrove canopy is still over the water. It won't be... 100% submerged unless the trees are really very short. Um, so very short trees that are submerged, you know, 100% at a specific date, you won't be able to map. But generally speaking, tides, you know, we are able to account for tides and we, it, it doesn't really affect our, our final estimate. Um, okay, for carbon stock assessments, did we differentiate between natural mangrove and plantation? No, we did not. Um, if you're thinking about the global map, we did not differentiate between natural mangrove and plantation. Um, the reality is natural mangroves cover a much larger area than plantations do. Um, so we, we did not have enough data to really separate the plantations from all other mangrove areas. Okay, question 31. Okay, why did we use reference data from 1998 to 2001 and observation from 2000 to 2018? Um, the goal of the, of the um, change map of, of that study was to um, study, to look at changes in mangrove from 2000 onward. And actually we looked at at uh, changes from 2000 to 2016, um, because that's actually when we started doing the study. We started in 2017, I think. Um, and so we have to use a reference data that was, you know, before, that started before, you know, our, our study time, um, and then ran it from then forward. Question 32, do you take into account the carbon traps in the sediment with regards to mangrove carbon stocks? Are there any models to this effect? So what we made for our global mangrove carbon and biomass map, um, we primarily focused on 
estimating canopy height and above ground biomass in mangroves. And then, well, not, not just above ground, and, and biomass in mangroves. So that is above ground and below ground. And for that, we used allometric equations that are able to um, determine the below ground. So here we mean living, so roots, um, that primarily on roots um, of the actual mangrove tree. Um, there are data sets of soil carbon stocks in mangroves. There is a global soil carbon, there are multiple global soil carbon data sets. So in this case, to, to get at total carbon stocks in mangroves, so this is above ground uh, of the tree, below ground for the actual trees, and the soil carbon, um, we used other published data sets. So there is a, a, a gridded soil carbon map produced by Sanderman et al. Um, that we that can be used in this in our paper we used um, standard values um, that were published um, previous to our to our paper coming out. I think the value that we used was 283 tons of carbon per hectare. Um, so it was the same value everywhere globally. But these are things that can be updated, obviously. Okay, the SMART data does not include mangroves in specific areas which we know from firsthand experience to exist. What could the reasons be for the exclusion of particular areas from the global mangrove map? Oh, um, so the, the SMART canopy height map was made using um, the Geary uh, et al. 2011 Global Distribution of Mangrove Forests. So this is a study that mapped uh, global mangrove extent for the year 2000 using Landsat data. Um, it was a great study. It's a great data set, but it's not perfect. So there may be many. There, we know that there are some areas where you know mangroves were misclassified. So there might be mangroves missing. There might be mangroves that are added. Um, you know this this map was made prior to. Um, the Landsat data archive being open, so there were many issues with clouds, and there were not as there was not nearly as much satellite data as there is available now. So yes, if we were to, were to redo these maps now, and there and they have been redone, there's a, the global mangrove uh, global mangrove watch data set, for example. Um, you know, those would probably be more accurate, especially if there are sites that are missing. But this is something that we know, yes. Uh, Abigail, question 34. Yep, I can take that. Um, so what is the best classifier for mangrove species mapping? Um, so random forest classification is a really robust classification, and we felt that that's a reliable classifier to use. Um, you can also use CART. However, um, there, uh, a student with Severe recently was comparing different classifiers for mapping mangroves, and they found that the random forest classification tended to have a higher accuracy than other models. So um, I, I would feel pretty confident in recommending that one. OK, um, so what are the satellite products used to map mangrove heights? So for the global data set, we used um, SRTM data, shuttle radar topography mission data. Um, that was also compared to ice sat glass. So this is the ice cloud elevation um, satellite. Um, this is the first spaceborne LIDAR ever. So um, that was for the global map. So this was for uh, year 2000 to 2006 um, data sets. Um, and then we also, the SRTM data was um, essentially cut so that it only covered those areas, only covered mangrove areas, and to detect the mangrove areas, we used the Geary et al. Um, map. Okay. Um, and if you go to our website or our app, you have a link to the paper, and you have a link to all the data products where you can download them, and it will have much more detail on the methodology that we used. Okay, 36. Have you used in your mapping any standards in terms of physical properties, minimum area to define what a mangrove is? 
something that can be used as an, at an international level and also required for VCS or Corel methodologies. Um, no, I mean, our minimum mapping unit is always going to be 30 meters because that is the highest resolution of the, of the satellite data we use most of the time. Um, a minimum area to define what a mangrove is yeah, in our case, you know, we we have we don't really map areas that are smaller than even 30 meters. You know, we'll probably get um, flagged as a uh, potentially an error. So we we usually aggregate, I would say, at least four pixels for it to be a mangrove. So that would be you know four times 30 by 30. Um, so that's uh, that is about, a, so three times would be about a hectare, um, 100 by 100. So three to four pixels by three to four pixels would be about one hectare. Usually, you know, that's one hectare seems like a, a reasonable minimum mapping unit. Okay. Um, 37, I think we have this one already. How do I correct for tides and mapping mangroves? Um, we, already answered that question earlier. Um, is the global mangrove carbon stock map validated by field measurements? Yes, we validated that map. We collected field data all over the world um, and separated them into training and validation data sets. Um, do we apply an emissions factor to mangrove loss to determine carbon emissions. Um, I mean, this is what you would do, yes, to, to determine carbon emissions, um, but it's not something that we have done yet. Which microwave band is good for estimating above ground biomass of mangrove vegetation? How do we eliminate adjacent salt marsh vegetation? Um, so I'm going to, I will answer the second question first. It's really difficult to, well, it's to separate between salt marsh and mangrove vegetation because they look similar. They're inundated vegetation. Um, this is, again, where you would use multiple data sets, for example, SAR and um, optical data together to separate the two, or if you have canopy height data um, to separate between mangroves because mangroves will be taller. On the microwave side, I recommend using um, L-band data, so um, longer wavelengths would be better. But again, there might be some saturation when you get to really high biomass, because if you just go from the microwave data directly to uh, try to detect um, to, to model biomass, you will have a saturation around 100 tons per hectare, meaning that you, you won't be able to differentiate between areas that are 100 tons or higher. Okay. Um, Question 41, how can we distinguish between erosion and sea level rise? For instance, in Bangladesh, we mentioned the change in the coastline as a result of erosion, while it might only be a change in sea level. Yes. Well, we couldn't detect, determine whether it, it was, whether the erosion was due to sea level rise or something else. So essentially, we labeled all changes due to water as erosion. And now the direct cause of the erosion, whether it's changes in weather patterns, changes in, um, in uh, river flow, or changes in, in currents, or sea level rise, you know, those are some of the factors that lead to erosion. OK. Um, question 42, is NDVI still reliable for studying mangroves? using satellite imagery since the ground is wet, which exposes different characteristics for mineral soil. Um, yes, well, that one of the reasons why we use NDVI is because it is, um, it's the normalized differentiated vegetation index. So 
this essentially allows us to specifically determine changes in the vegetation, not in the underlying soil. For that, you would use a different index. Um, okay, question 43. Yes, we mentioned the TANMX and the SSTM DEM to measure mango height, but those models are a DSM and not a DTM, correct? And I thought that those were modeling the canopy surface, not the terrain surface. Can you elaborate on this? And can you maybe tell us about the coastal dam and the new NASA dam that are supposed to be corrected for vegetation and therefore are supposed to be good DTM? Okay, lots of questions. So, yes, TANMX and SRTM are DSMs. Um, the advantage that we have is that mangroves grow at sea level. They don't grow anywhere where there's any type of underlying topography. So, for one, we know that there is no underlying topography, so the height measured by, ten, by, the, D, by the DSMs, the digital surface models, is actually a form of canopy height. Um, now, if you were using the same method to map trees, the height of trees, on a hill or on a mountain, you would have to subtract the height of the ground below it to get at canopy height. We do have to adjust the height measurements, so we 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 have to do so, uh, what we call a bias correction from the height measured from um, the SRTM or TANMX data sets because it actually doesn't measure um, because the SAR signal actually penetrates into the forest canopy. And so it actually measures the height somewhere within the tree. It doesn't measure just the height of the tallest branch or of the tallest leaf or the, the top of the canopy. So this is where we use LIDAR data and field measurements of canopy height to essentially shift the height of the D of TANMX or uh, SRTN, uh, shift it um, so that we're measuring the top canopy height. Um, and then questions about the coastal dam and the new NASA dam that are supposed to be corrected for vegetation. Um, yes, so the NASA dam is an update of the SRTM um, digital elevation model uh, calibrated with ISAT glass and also corrected for vegetation. So yes, this, this would be a better data set if you're, trying, if you're interested in getting at terrain height. So that is the height of the ground. Um, because before, what, what the SRTM gives you is the height of the ground plus the height of whatever is on top of the ground. So a tree, a building, um, any type of structure uh, on top of the ground um, will be measured by the um, DSMs, visual surface models. Uh, similarly, the coastal dam, I, I don't know much about that, but I think that this is, again, a data set that corrected for vegetation. Um, and, and therefore um, is trying to do a better job at measuring the surface of the actual ground. Okay. Um, question 44. In 1990, Myanmar possessed over 1.2 million mangroves in coastal areas. After 30 years, over half a million of mangroves uh, remain in coastal areas. How can we use remote sensing systems to be effective in the place of mangrove ecosystem conservation? Um, you know, this is a really important question and is in many ways kind of the end goal of many of the work that we have done, um, is to actually be able to better monitor changes that are happening. In this case, you know, in Myanmar, we have observed a really high rate of deforestation of mangroves. Um, that we can see from space. This is something that we mapped, and this was something that in our paper we we found that Myanmar had, you know, really high, uh, not the highest rate of change. One of the, Myanmar was one of the only countries where there wasn't a decline of, there wasn't the same decline in mangrove losses since 2000 that we saw in other countries. Um, so yes, I think you know knowing what happened in the past and where it happened is really important and helps us. Um, prioritize conservation areas. Okay, and now question 45. Can we visualize the area of mangrove communities? So a community of Rhizophora, for example, species, after identifying it in the field and analyzing it by remote sensing. I think this question is really similar to the species mapping question that we saw before. 
So can we can we actually map species extent or species composition? So I will refer you back to that question. Okay, so I think we are at time. Thank you everyone for your questions. It, I think we were able to get through all of them. Um, the transcript will be posted to the web page within a week and we hope to see you again on the 12th for the second part of this webinar series.